Hello, hello. Happy Wednesday. This is Pastor Thomas. We're going to be out of the sanctuary until January 2nd. So I just wanted to come and bring you, just share with you something that the Lord is talking to me about, that he wants us to talk about instead of tomorrow, Thursday. Amen. I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas. This time of the year, for some people, is not very merry. And I think it becomes worse because of wounds that we may have on the inside of us. And so God wants to heal us. So, before we begin, let me say a prayer. Father, this is your word. This is your truth. I am your servant Father, speak through me by the power of your Holy Spirit. Your oracles, your truth, touch the hearts of the hearers. Cause a shift in their hearts. Cause a shift in their lives. Cause a shift in their atmosphere. To bring them closer to you. To make them see you clearer. To bring deliverance and freedom and that abundant joy, that abundance that you promised, that you paid for with your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, God is God. God is God. And we cannot change him. He says in Malachi 3, I am the God, I change not. He says in Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, for the last several decades, we've heard the word preached, or I shouldn't say the word, we've heard words preached that somehow made us be convinced that if we are saved, everything is going to be okay, and we'll never have any trouble, and oh, all things will be well with us. I want to tell you that is not anywhere in the Bible. Jesus says in Matthew 16 so clearly, if anyone, if anyone is going to come after me, let him deny himself, and that right there is trouble. Because we are I, 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 me, me, me. And our flesh wars against the spirit. And so that causes tumult, causes chaos, causes trouble. Until, like David says, we quiet ourselves like a weaned child. You know, that tumult, that, 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 that anxiety, that just... <laughs> that a child goes through as they move from the breast, that security to a bottle. And they cry and they cry and they create such havoc that even the parent cries. But we know we cannot keep that child on that bottle. They cannot. I mean, sorry, on the breast forever. They can't even stay on the bottle forever. But they have to move from the breast to the bottle. So they can get the right nutrients. Well, it's the same with us from the natural to the spiritual. We've got to teach, allow the grace of the Holy Spirit to calm us in God's ways. So no, things don't go like we think they should. But I, like I told somebody, I think today or yesterday, the presence of trouble is not a sign of the absence of God. No, not at all. We just have to learn as we shift from the carnal, as we shift from being a baby with milk, we just have to learn to stand on what God says and not what we feel, not what we're experiencing. Ephesians 1 20 tells us when God raised Jesus from the dead, it says, and I'm going to read the rest of it. He seated him at his right hand in the heavenly 
places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under the feet of Jesus and give Jesus to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So we cannot adjust God's laws, God's ordinances that he set in place. Jesus, who is in us through his spirit, he is the head of all principality, all power, all dominion, all might. And so we have to quiet ourselves to realize when we come to Christ, we come into a different realm. Our walk becomes different. We're beating a tune to a different master. Listen, we just can't change God's ordinances. In 1 Corinthians, I'm going right now into what we're going to talk about today. In 1 Corinthians 6, 15, it says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, says he, shall become one flesh. Today, we're talking about breaking soul ties. We're not talking about new age. We're not talking about some supernatural spiritual thing. We're talking about breaking the ties that come between a man and a woman when they join themselves together. And now, Anybody's joining themselves with anybody. Man joining with man, women with women. It seems like young people are having sex like they changed, they buy new jeans, you know. Just, just with anybody, anywhere, anytime. It's just like a game. And we don't understand the spiritual ramifications of joining in sex with a person. Let's look at it. It says we become one. We become one with that person. God ordained it to be that way, that that man and his wife become one. When you become one, the, a bond is formed. And that's why sometimes when you look at older married couples, they actually look like each other. They finish each other's sentences. They actually just just seem the same that's because they're flowing into each other there's a bond that's formed that god created to be that way he created it to give us a picture of the bond that is formed between us and him that's why it says in verse 17 he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. As in the natural, so in the spiritual. When you have sex with somebody, God's law, God has ordained that you become one. I don't care who's, who it is, you become one. I tell people all the time, if you have something that is joined together. If you have two pieces of paper that is joined together, when you try to take it apart, when you try, and I can't, you maybe you can't see it well, but when you try to ugh, take that thing apart, mm, mm, when you try to take it apart, it's difficult because you see this this paper has some of the other one 
and the other one leaves residue on this one. So when you become joined together with somebody, when you get up and move on, you take a piece of them. They take a piece of you. I just heard, I can't remember who said, soul tie is like a bridge. It's like a bridge where spirits are exchanged between you and that person. And you have to be careful to understand the ramifications of this. Listen, when you become sexually active with a person, you form a tie with them. Body, soul, and spirit. The next thing, 1 Corinthians 6.18 says, Flee sexual immorality. Flee fornications, some translations say. Every sin that a man does is outside of the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. And do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So the only sin that's outside of the body, I'm sorry, the only sin that's against the body is sexual sin. Every other sin is outside of us. Sexual sin is in and against the temple, which is God's. So when we have sex with a person, we become one. Sexual sin is against God's temple. Let's continue reading. 1 Corinthians 16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Your body is God's temple. And when you sin sexually, then you're sinning against God's temple. And he said, I will destroy that person. Sin against God's temple, God will destroy. He said in verse, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 6 in verse 17. It says, and I mentioned this before, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So if you are one spirit with God and you're sleeping with someone or several people that you're not morally or legally married to, and I say morally because in God's eye, Sex between a man and a man, sex between a woman and a woman is an abomination. It's not legal in God's eyes. So if you're not married morally or legally to that person that you're having sex with, your spirit, if it belongs to God, will war against God's spirit in you. There'll be this chaos, this constant war and it brings a picture to my mind I just heard of somebody who decides that God doesn't exist anymore that's one of the struggles you'll have in order for you to do what you want to do because that desire to sleep with a woman if you're a woman is so great you're gonna have to say that God doesn't exist you're gonna have to say that there's no God you're gonna have to say that you don't believe in God because here all around you is God's truth that you're not supposed to do this. Not only are you not supposed to do it, it's an abomination to him. And he will destroy that person. God cannot and will not undo and go back 
on his word. He just will not. So let no one deceive himself. If any, any among you seem to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. So if you think you're so wise, oh, God doesn't exist anymore, or, or God is a God of love, and, and he's not going to keep me out of heaven just because I'm doing X, Y, and Z. The Bible says, become a fool and believe God's word. Just become a fool. Don't be so wise in your own eyes. God is not going to change his word for us. He's not. I'm looking up a scripture that I uh, um I forgot to look up. I'm going to look that up right quick. But listen, this is this is this is important especially in this hour when so many are struggling just simply struggling with so much in their minds and so much in their hearts i want to tell you one of the reasons could be they've got so many soul ties not broken they're not themselves there's so many pieces of themselves left in in Venezuela, left in Florida, left here, left there. So many pieces left everywhere. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 says, Let no one deceive himself. We can deceive ourselves. That's the spirit of the Antichrist that's in the latter days, Timothy tells us, in, in the book of Timothy, Paul tells us, people will be deceived and they will deceive. Oh, it's so sad to see a person turn from God, but not only turn from God, convince their kids to turn from God. Don't be deceived. Keep your mind focused on who we are serving it's not a puppet that we can turn. It's not a sugar daddy. It's the God of the universe, the creator, Jehovah. And no matter what the world says, God is God and will be God. The Bible says he catches the wise in their own craftiness. The Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. That's 1 Corinthians 3.20. There's so much confusion in so many and madness and fear and anxiety and self-hate and self-rejection and intense hate for others and murder and unforgiveness and bitterness and anger. Because people are confused. They don't know who they are, what they are, where they are, why they are. And broken promises fall in this category too. Watch promises that you make. Stop making promises and then you don't keep it. If you make a promise, write it down. And if you find for whatever reason that you cannot keep it, tell the person. Don't just go about your business as if nothing has happened. Broken promises, broken covenants are the same that bring confusion and all sorts of doors are opened up. So I didn't want to let that part go. But... All the complications that that arise when we already have soul ties. And some have soul ties with 10 different men, 15 men, 50 people. Um, I heard of a young man who had sex with 50 people. And he says, 
I just don't know who I am. I, I just don't know who I am. And I, I think I can find that video and I'll put, it, put the link in the description. All this confusion of soul ties becomes further aggravated, amplified when an abortion or several abortions are included. Now we've got shame, we've got guilt, we've got anger, we've got so much piled on to the soul ties. Because many use abortion as a birth control. Or you have unwanted children who now you pass on that rejection to. The baby in the womb can feel that you don't want it. Remember, it's spirit to spirit. That child is not a blob. That child is a living being from the time of conception. God says in 139 Psalm, he says, before you were conceived in your mother's womb, I knew you. He says, while you were yet unformed, I knew you and I wrote in a book all the parts. God knows that child before that child enters the womb, after that child enters the womb, it's not a blob. It's a living thing, and it can feel the stress of the parent. So all these stresses and anxiety and fear and confusion and anger and self-hate and rejection, and it's our psyche being scarred and bruised and infected literally possessed by doors that we open this week I want to thank those of you who are still fasting with me as I fasted I was laying in the bed you know talking to God and watching a Christian show at the same time and suddenly it seems like came into my view these um and they have so many ugly little things that we make and buy for our children and we don't realize the devil is trying to get us acquainted with these spirits. So when it comes, we won't be surprised or whatever. We'll just accept it. Listen, I saw this ugly thing hidden like under a shelf. And then it morphed and changed faces, even uglier. Or maybe it's two of them. I don't know. But I said to God, what is that? And God said, that's secrets. Hidden secrets. Some families have hidden secrets, things that were done in the family that they insist must stay in the family when the person should have gone to the police and gotten locked up. You know, people finding out the person who they thought was their cousin is really their sister. Um, just, just, just real stuff that happens. Hidden secret sins, Psalm 19 talks about those hidden things that we want the Lord to shine light on. Deliver me from hidden sins. Maybe it's not your sin, but a sin from the third and fourth generation that is now passed on to you. And the more people you sleep with, the more complications added to it, it's like a snowball rolling. It gets bigger and bigger, more complicated, more damage to your psyche, more all this going on in, in here and in the emotions. Sexual sin, any sexual sin outside of the marriage. And even if you're married now, if you haven't asked God to forgive you for those relationships that you had before or during the marriage, and you haven't asked God to break those soul ties, check and see that's why maybe you're having such struggles, such things in your mind, such even sexual deviant thoughts, even difficulty with your sexual relationship with your spouse. Sexual invasion, such as rape of a child or like coercion for sex, all these can form soul ties even though it was unwanted. It still has to be broken. Think in the Bible of Amnon and Tamar. 
David's two children, Amnon was so in lust for his for his sister Tamar that he coerced her and raped her and when he was done kicked her right out of the room she went crazy and of course murder entered in because his brother murdered him all these are soul ties and the results of it were seeing the symptoms of soul ties of sexual sin how about childhood acting out? I remember talking to um, somebody who asked me to read their book for them. They were trying to publish a book. And when I started that book, I told her, this is pornography. She was exalting of the fact that as young children, they would rub on each other and bump and grind. No, that's pornography. That's forming soul ties even as a child. No, I don't want to read that, and I don't know that anybody's going to publish that except the pornography industry. But that's not a Christian book at all. Hiding the truth. You know, Isaiah 58 says that we should not hide from our flesh. And we could take that two ways. We could take it don't hide from the people that we love, our flesh, or it could mean our very own flesh. I know I see that sometimes. It, I see in pictures. So I'm maybe sitting here and suddenly a thought, I'll see that thought and I'll try to drown it. And I have to remind myself, no, what is that thought? We have so many thoughts, so many imaginations that we've hidden that creates chaos that eventually becomes an act because we think on it too much. These are ties that need to be broken. You know, I want to encourage you because the only place in the Bible where God ran, the picture of God running, was when the prodigal son came to himself came to himself and realized something is not right in my life. Even my my father's servants live better than I. I'm going home and ask his forgiveness. I'm going and humble myself. And before he could get to the father, the father came running. Why? Because he was looking for him over and over every day. He's looking for his son. It was very undignified in that culture for a father to run, much less go to a sinful son and hug him and put the robe on him. But that's how God loves us and wants to reach out to us to give us that abundant life. What more can he do? He died for us. He died for us. Don't be guilty of calling God a liar. When we say things like, and I told somebody that just today, oh, God has forgotten about me. Why does everybody else do well and not me? These are the things that let you know that you need healing. And maybe from those soul ties that have been formed. God doesn't love me. I try so hard. I love him. But everything goes wrong. Don't call God a liar. God says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. He died to prove it. God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. How can you say he forgot you? That's a lie. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am truth. And he said in John 8, 44, the devil is not only a liar, but the father of lies, a murderer, a destroyer, and the truth is not and never will be in him. Every time he speaks, he speaks a lie. So if you're feeling all those things that God doesn't care, that nothing is working right, that there's no hope for you, that this is happening and that is happening, and you don't see that light on the end of the tunnel, you need healing on the inside. You truly need healing. 
And so we're talking about those soul ties that you need healing from. Listen, God says in 1 John 1, 8, 9, he says, he'll forgive you if you confess your sins. He says, I'm faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. All in any language means all. So we can run to him. He says, I throw your sin as far as the east is from the west. He says, I remember your sin no more. He says, come, let us reason together. Though your, though your sins be, you know, scarlet, I'll cleanse you. Listen, come to God. Let him show you. Let the Holy Spirit show you those things that you've opened doors to that need to be shut, that need to be broken so you can walk in freedom. You know what? We can bring you up to the altar and we can pour oil on you 10 times a day. We can pray for you every day. We can fast for you. But if you have a root inside of you that's not uprooted, that's not cast out and replaced with God's healing virtues, with the balm of Gilead, then that thing is going to come back. It's like my 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 yard in our country where I grew up we had tons of fruit trees you name it we had it in that yard and sometimes they'll get to cutting the tree down but the tree will grow back why because the root it's not uprooted so it will grow back so if you don't ask the Holy Spirit ask the Holy Spirit Spirit to shine a light in you where those hidden secret things may be and don't be afraid it's very safe with the Holy Spirit very safe with Jesus so now he can unplug them and replace them first thing you have to be is this be willing to face truth we're not very honest people. The Bible says in Jeremiah, the heart is what? Desperately wicked. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. So if we don't allow the Lord, he says, who can understand it? God. So if we don't allow him to quiet that heart, to tame that heart, to heal that heart, then we can lie to ourselves. That's where that deception comes in. Oh, God doesn't exist anymore. Be willing to face truth. Jesus is truth. God is truth. Be willing for healing. Some of you, you have reckless behaviors. You do reckless things because you need healing. What are some of the signs that you need healing and that you may have a soul tie? Drug use, alcohol, sexual deviance, the thoughts and ideas in your mind, even when you're having sex with your natural spouse, is there in your mind. Masturbation, hating yourself, don't even want to look at yourself in the mirror. Some go as far as cutting themselves. Again, reckless behaviors, hiding from people, or you always have a bag packed with you. You're always taking a bag with you packed and ready for flight. Be willing for truth. Ask the Holy Spirit to shine a light in that hidden room, in the crevices of your heart, in your soul. And as He shine your light, confess and renounce anything you've been connected with, men, women, um, secret societies, lying, stealing. If you're one, you've been perpetrated against, somebody's harmed you and brought that, that, that 
angst in your soul, forgive them. And listen, forgiving somebody does not mean that you have to go hug them or kiss them. It means simply releasing them from your emotions, from your need for vengeance, and turn it over to the Lord, trust in the Lord who says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. There was a time when somebody kept hurting me over and over and over and over. And I told God it wasn't fair that this person was getting away with it. And God, oh, he freed me that day. He took me to Ecclesiastes. I think it's Ecclesiastes 8, 11, or it's 11, 8. Came in with, but it's in Ecclesiastes. You can Google it. It says, though a sinner sins a hundred times, and it be well with him. He says, though a sinner sins a hundred times, eventually they will pay the price. And that set me free. Because then I knew God was going to take care of it. God was going to fix that person. God was going to, you know, avenge me. And he did. And so forgiving means that you need to release that person. Some of you are actively involved in situations where people are hurting you in terrible ways. Constantly allow God Allow his grace to cause you to forgive. In other words, throw that thing on God. Let him avenge you. And he will. And ask him to heal your soul. Don't go around with a wounded soul. That's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. One of the things that he'll do. He'll comfort you. He'll heal you. He'll pour the balm of Gilead in you. His anointing breaks yokes. So forgive the people who've perpetrated evil against you. Forgive yourself. This is one that is the hardest one. People cannot forgive themselves. I cannot believe. People will say things like, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I did that. How could I do that? And this is 20 years later. Have you asked God to forgive you? Yes. Then you're calling him a liar. Because he doesn't remember what you did. Because when you asked him to forgive you, he says, I did. He threw it as far as the east is from the west. So how can you not forgive yourself? Are you saying you're greater than God? Are you saying you're God? That's sin against God. That's calling God a liar. Stop being arrogant and prideful. For, confess that as pride. Forgive yourself. You have no choice. The Bible says, and, and a good scripture to read is Matthew 18. If you don't forgive from your heart, your father will not forgive you. He also says it in Matthew 6 in the Lord's Prayer. Twice that thing was repeated. The only thing that was repeated in that prayer, at the end of that prayer, is forgive. So forgive. Forgive. Don't call God a liar. Some of you, heaven forbid, you need to even say to God, God, I forgive you, just to get that thing out. I mean, just imagine you're blaming God. Receive God's forgiveness. Ask Him for the grace to receive His forgiveness. And then learn how God wants you to live as that new person. So let's conclude this message. When you sleep with someone who you're not legally and morally married to, you form a soul tie. And you might wonder, if that person is always depressed, why are you depressed? Because that spirit is passing. You form a soul tie, a bond with them. Spirit, soul, and body. If you already belong to the Lord, there's going to be a constant war with your spirit and God's spirit at war because you're sinning. Or 
because you've got these hidden secret things that need to be confessed. That is how God created us. Because he intended that bond to form between you and your spouse that you're legally married and morally married to. If you're, if you're in a relationship with somebody else, you can't pray while you're having sex with them. You can't even look at God or talk to God. If you can, you're not saved. That's not God. You need to repent and get saved. The marriage bed is undefiled. God approves. He created it that way. So each time you walk away from a sexual relationship, remember, you take a piece of you, you, you take a piece of them with you, and they take a piece of them, of you with them. And that's where all that confusion comes from. See? I cannot even get these two papers to tear apart properly. I can't. Because they're bonded together. And pieces of one comes off on the other. That's why you're always thinking of that person even when you don't want to. It, like, like I said, the two glue together. And that's why the pulling apart brings confusion, madness, anxiety, depression, a myriad of spirits, hidden things that, that are at work in your body, in your flesh, cancers, diabetes, high blood pressure. So many things come as a result of the angst that's at work in you, that guilt, that shame that you may not be able to name, but it's there working against you because it's against God's spirit. It's against God's temple. So you need to stop. Stop. Let go of your own wisdom. You cannot enter heaven this way. You just can't. I don't have time to show you all the scriptures. There's so much in the word that says even the wicked or those who are learned to do wickedness. And I read that today in Malachi. As a matter of fact, I want to I wanna read that. I read that today in Malachi, and it made me stop and look. Malachi chapter 4. It says this in Malachi chapter 4. Um, it says in chapter 4, verse 1, For behold... The day comes that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yeah, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that comes shall burn them, said the Lord. So all that do wickedly, not only the wicked, but not only the wicked, but those that do wickedly also, those that do wickedly so we've got choices that we have to make as christians we just got choices that we have to make god wants us whole complete when times like this christmas comes a lot of people get something is triggered the loneliness the the self-hate the rejection all that stuff is triggered and stirred up we need to be set free. I'm going to post in the description a prayer by Robert Clancy for breaking soul ties. But it's nothing like you and God getting together and praying about it and talking about it and taking authority over it and renouncing it. I'm going to end by reading Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 15. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayer, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him the eyes of your understanding being enlightened 
that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and give him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I want to pray for you. You who are going through terrible depression, anxiety, um, mental trauma, things that are happening to you, maybe there are childhood trauma issues. I, I'm also putting in the description. Um, there's a there's a lesson in my 13 week marriage series lesson 10 that talks about childhood trauma and I have a therapist who a licensed therapist who I interview who talks about all the trauma that comes all the troubles from childhood trauma so some of you even as child you've been sexually abused and you haven't allowed that thing to be healed. It's an open wound still or one that seemed to be healed, but as soon as something touches it, something triggers, boom, it opens up and pus flies everywhere. So we need healing. We need to understand God's boundaries for sex. We need to understand it's not because he hates us, and I read that today as part of my um my Bible study, because I read at least three passages, one from the Old Testament, one from the New, and I keep going, going through it so I could complete the Bible, but God told me in 2001 to read Corinthians, so he hasn't told me to stop, so I read Corinthians every single day, except maybe Sundays because of all the things for church. But I read that today in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 when Paul was telling the people about sex. He was telling them, and let me let, I'm going to read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Again, he said to this, and this I speak for your own profit. Not that I may cast a snare on you, but for that which is right, and that you may attend to the Lord without distraction. So I want to say that I'm not speaking this to put a snare on you. This is for your own profit. That all the distractions may be removed so you can attend to the Lord. So you can walk, like it says in John 10, 10. He came to give you life and life more abundantly. But instead, we're living the first part of John 10, 10. We're allowing the thief to come in and steal and destroy. And God says, no, that's not what I died for. That's not the price I paid for you. The priceless blood that was paid for you. So, I want to give a couple of words of knowledge, but I want to also pray for you and ask you to watch that video by Robert Clancy that I'm going to put in the description. If any of you are suffering from childhood trauma, watch Lesson 10. Um, that I'm going to put in the description, a link in the description that you can listen to. We need knowledge. We need the knowledge of Christ. We don't need man's opinions and man's fancy stories anymore. This is not the hour. This is not the day. We need a pure 
unadulterated word of God. What thus says the Lord. We need the Holy Spirit to ignite in our hearts, in our, in our spirits, to stir it up so we can get whole because we're passing on to our children, which means it's going to go on to the next generation. He promised. He says in Deuteronomy 29, 29, he says there are secrets that belong to the Lord. He says, well, when I reveal it to you, it's yours for you and for your children from this time to forever. That's what he wants for us to walk in his secrets. He said it's not hidden from us. The mysteries are for us. We need the word again. Some of you, you've gotten to a place where church is not important anymore. That's because it never, it hasn't been for a while. Church hasn't been important for a while. Because God hasn't been important for a while. Renew. Renew your relationship with God before it's too late. Before that slow fade happens. And you find yourself out somewhere we are not supposed to be with your pants down when the trumpet sounds. Like I just read in Malachi, there's a day of the Lord that is coming. And it's even upon us when we will all stand before the Lord and give an account. He says, I'm knocking at the door of your heart. Will you hear? Will you listen? Will you exercise your muscles once again? With the things of God through his word revealed by his spirit. There's no other way. There's only one way to heaven. Jesus Christ crucified on the cross. No other way. He sent his Holy Spirit to teach us. The Holy Spirit, it says in John 16, will teach us everything about Christ. He will not talk about himself. He'll talk about Christ. Christ is our Savior, our Redeemer, our Intercessor. Christ is our Lord. And He, we're celebrating His birth. We don't know that He was born December the 25th. But we do know He was born, was born to a virgin, was born by God's Holy Spirit, not from a man. And now we're celebrating that. And we want to be joyous in it. Even if we might only have beans and rice, we still want to eat that beans and rice with joy and gladness because of our Savior who lives with us, who is coming again. Amen? Father, I lift up these, your people, to you. Those who've slept with somebody, not their spouse. That they will recognize that it's wrong. It's against your temple. They recognize the penalty is death. And now they're suffering the consequences of so many symptoms. Emotionally, spiritually, financially in their bodies, in relationships. Father, you paid the price for us to walk away free from every bondage. You paid the price. And so now we come before you, Lord, and we confess. We've sinned against you by having unlawful sexual relationships with Father, we confess. We've even have sexual thoughts in our minds that are unlawful. You said, Jesus, if a man even thinks about a woman in his mind to lust, he's committed sexual sin. We've committed those thoughts in our mind. We confess it, Lord, and ask for your grace. You paid the price for us to say no to our flesh. We receive your forgiveness. We receive that grace to live right. Father, we confess self-sex. We've gotten ourselves so caught up in the lie that this is how we can be satisfied. This is how we can be made a man or a woman or whatever. Lies from the enemy that keeps us so occupied 
like the movie Papillon, where the guy refused to be caught up in what everybody else was doing, masturbating, so they couldn't think. He kept his mind clear and refused that so that he could escape from his prison. Lord, we confess those hidden secret things that we do behind closed doors that we subject you to because you promise never to leave. Forgive us, God, for subjecting you to unclean thoughts, unclean acts, self-sex, pornography. We're looking at things. David says, I will not put anything before my eyes that will cause sin, that will cause you to be hurt. God, we've put things before our eyes. We've lusted after people's bodies. We've harmed them by committing adultery through pornography. We confess. We ask your forgiveness. Lord, we renounce every soul tie, even soul ties that were formed by people who raped us. We renounce those soul ties. We curse them. And we say, go, according to God's word, to the pit of hell. In Jesus' name. Stay in the dry places till Jesus come. And God, we ask you to come in to our bodies, to our minds, to our souls, to our emotions. Come into every cell of our being with your healing virtue, with your purity. Grace us that we be set aside for you so our thoughts can be clean, so we can come back to our righted minds again, come back to that self that you created us to be. We can become one again. We can get back those pieces that were walked away with, and we can send those pieces back to where they came from and become one in you again. We confess we haven't kept our temple clean. We repent, Lord, and say we will keep our temple clean. By studying your word through your Holy Spirit teaching us, we'll pull the Bible up and say, what do you want us to learn today, Holy Spirit? What are you saying today? Show me Jesus in the word. Show me Jesus. And then show me, myself, through Jesus' eyes in the Word. Help us to grow again in you and become strong in you. And turn our backs on the devil's shenanigans, on the Antichrist spirit, on selfishness. Thank you, Lord, for doing it in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, God, there's so much. There's so much. And I just want you to be encouraged today. I have a name, Jesus. 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 They named you Jesus. And the person who wanted you to be Jesus understood who Jesus was and was wanting you to be given to Jesus. They wanted you to be identified with Jesus. And you know when we're children, Jesus, we have to go with what our parents want and do. But there come a time in our life when the fate of our parent doesn't work for us and cannot work for us anymore. Jesus, your fate has got to be your fate now. You've got to. Christ is pulling at you. He's knocking at your door. He loves you. He loves you. Don't be afraid to open your heart to him. Ask him to come in and teach you. Get you a Bible. Get you a journal. Learn about him. Don't waste any more time, Jesus. And then I've got Marcia. But I also heard Marsha and Marshall in that variation. The names just came like that. So I put them together. Marcia, you've been admired as a child for your beauty. You've been admired as a child for 
being different and you 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 gloried in it and who wouldn't but it came to a place marcia marshall marcia where you started questioning they say i'm this and that but it, i don't feel that way that's because they forced who they wanted you to be on you and never give you the chance to figure out who you are. God said it's time. It's time that you come to me, Marcia, Marshall, Marcia. He said, I've called you by name. He says, I know you intimately, but you need to know me because it's only the one that comes to me. And I know that they love me. Only those that are going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Don't be fooled. He says, come. There's so much time, but now is the hour. Now is the time. I'm knocking at your door. Stop running from pillar to post. And just look at me. I am God. I am the one that died for you. I'm the one that gave my heart for you. I'm the one that's the lover of your soul. And then I hear Janice. Janice, God loves you. He's not mad at you. He's not. He died for you. Anyone who would die for you loves you that much, has an investment in your life. And I hear you understand about investments. The things that you invest in, you care for and watch over. Where did you think that comes from? That comes from God himself. He has invested in you, Janice. He loves you so much. And so much has happened to you. And you feel like, I, I can't believe, because it seems like every time I believe, something else keeps happening. That's that spirit warring against the Lord. You've got to settle down. You've got to submit yourself to Him. You've got to stop fighting Him. And understand that he is God and not you. You cannot come to him your way. It must be his way. His way is Jesus on the cross. And then I've got Genevieve. Genevieve and that name came twice. And whenever a name comes twice, double like that, there's an importance on that person. Genevieve, you are called. You are called to the marketplace because God says, I'm putting riches in your hand so that you can finance my kingdom. You, that go-to person, um, if somebody like I'm pastoring a church that I actually have a sanctuary, it's very small, but at the same time, it costs money to run it. It costs money. And, and so... Like, for instance, we need musicians, we need instruments, or another, a, a better example. My daughter went to a church whose instruments were stolen because they rent that church. And so they had to move, their, every time they use their instruments, they have to break everything down, move it out, and it's stored in somebody's car. That's right there. A prescription for, for a thief. So it was stolen. And so somebody was able to write a check to purchase new equipment. God says, you are that go-to person. He says, he'll tell you. He doesn't want anybody pulling on you. Don't be fooled. There are people who are going to pull on you and tell you their sob stories. I've got people that put... Instead of telling me thank you for the message, all they put is, I've got a need. Fund my, you know, whatever. You're a pastor, so surely you're going to give so many cons everywhere. God says, I'll tell you where to give. I told you where to give your 10% tithe. The rest that you put aside that I share with you, investments. He said, I'm going to show you who to give it to and where to give it to. I'll show you. Say no to anybody else, Genevieve. And then Javier, Javier, you're God's man for the hour. Javier, 
You are God's man for this hour, this time. This time where the Antichrist spirit is rampant everywhere. You know, there are things I can't even say on Facebook because once I say it, they shut me down or they slow my messages or something because the world doesn't want the truth. But God says, I've called you, Javier, to speak my truth. He says, and, and this means a lot to you, Genesis, um, Ezekiel, Ezekiel 2 and 3. He says, though they will hear or though they will forbear, he says, they'll know that I sent you. He says, you just tell them, because if you don't tell them what I told you to tell them, then their blood be upon your hand. So be encouraged. Lydia, Isaiah, be encouraged. God loves you. Listen, God's got a plan for your life. No matter how dark the hour is, just before the dawn, it seems like that's darkest hour. There is good in everything. Every experience that God gives you is for a purpose. Ask him, what is your purpose? What are you calling me to in this hour? Why am I going through this? What is it for? Don't be afraid to ask questions. Amen? God loves you. Be blessed. Be encouraged. And do not allow Christmas the lie about Christmas that it's only to get, 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 get. It's a lie. Christmas is about giving. God so loved the world that he gave. He left his heavenly throne. He left his deity. He entrusted himself to a young girl who could have aborted him in this hour. In that culture, it was it was a sin to be pregnant and not married. It was a stonable offense. But he entrusted himself because he saw you, Lydia. He saw you, Isaiah. He saw me. He saw our needs. Listen, this is a God who cares. Stop taking it lightly and begin to realize he has a purpose, a big purpose, a good purpose. Amen? So God bless you. Have a very Merry Christmas. Choose to be thankful. And don't forget, any of you who are suffering from trauma, uh, don't forget to use the resources that I put in the description. Bye, and I'll see you after Christmas. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. I'll be back. I'll be back Sunday after Christmas to give you a little word. I'm sure God has a word. Bye-bye. Bless you.